Hello everyone, aloha from Hawaii. I'm Dexter Mark and I'll be your host for the Bloom Futaba Memorial Lectures. Thank you for participating in the 21st annual presentation. The first then named Futaba Memorial Lectures was held in the year 2000 and featured a new professor from Musashino University in Tokyo, whose name was Ken Tanaka. He spoke on American Pure Land Buddhism at the dawn of a new millennium. Okaide, welcome home to the Bloom Futaba series, Professor Ken. The 2020 Bloom Futaba Memorial Lectures is the first online version and offers the opportunity to share the teachings not only in Honolulu, but globally. Konnichiwa to our viewers in Japan and hola to our viewers in Brazil. Hello to the mainland USA, Canada, and throughout the Hawaiian Islands. This year, through technology and the opportunity of the COVID-19 pandemic, we can share Tanaka Sensei's insights with a much broader audience. Thank you all for managing to log into this Zoom meeting. For first timers, it may be a bit daunting to find out where the controls are. I will mute everyone except Dr. Tanaka. So please type your questions and comments in the chat section. You'll find the chat button in your control, bot control panel. Please send your questions and comments via chat at any time, and we will select questions from there during questions and answers. Chat messages will only be sent to Dr. Tanaka and myself and will not be viewable by everyone. Professor Tanaka will also be fielding live questions from the audience during the Q&A, and he will manage the selection and unmuting of the participants. Please wave your hand vigorously in front of your face to indicate that you have a question or comment, or you can use the chat message to say that you want to say something. The format for today will be about 60 minutes of presentation by Dr. Ken, followed by about 30 minutes of Q&A and then a 15 minute break for home refreshments, et cetera. Then a repeat. After the close of the session, we'll have an additional 30 minutes of what in Hawaii we call pau hana time, which is, means when work is done, um, there is a continuing um, gathering. And so for those of you that want to remain and chat with Dr. Tanaka, you'll have that chance after our uh, 4.15 closing. This presentation will be available on YouTube by August 1st. So if you need to break away, portions or the entirety can be viewed at a later time. Please bear with me as we learn how to produce these types of educational programs and the technology required. Zoom was selected for its popularity and its general ease of use. Of course, we must acknowledge the convener of this program, Mrs. Dorothy Bloom, wife of the originator, Dr. Alfred Bloom. We also want to thank the Futaba Memorial Lecture Fund, the University of Hawaii Foundation the Lander Fund, the Hompahonganji Hawaii Betsuin Temple, and of course, my life partner, Faymar. Dr. Kenneth Kenshin Tanaka is a professor emeritus of Sashishino University in Tokyo. He retired in 2018 after 20 years as a professor of Buddhist studies. He graduated from Stanford University, the Institute of Buddhist Studies, IBS, in Berkeley, Tokyo University, and the University of California at Berkeley, where he received his PhD. He received Jodo Shinshu ordination in 1978. He then served as the associate professor and assistant dean at IBS for 10 years and a resident priest for three years in a California Shin Buddhist temple. He is the author of the Buddhist classic, Ocean, and we are delighted to host his premiere of his new book, Jewels. Professor Tanaka. Hello, 
nice to be here with you today. And uh, I'm coming to you from Tokyo, Japan. Today, for this lecture, we have people signing in from all over the world, or almost, uh, for, from a number of uh, locations. Uh, Brazil, uh, Canada, mainland USA, Hawaii, and Japan. So it's actually really an exciting time. In a way, this is one of the outcomes of the, the pandemic and one of the maybe the positive outcomes of the pandemic. And one other thing I wanted to share with you was that because that I am home more often and um, not really going out, I took it upon myself to start a little garden. And here is a product, Ta -da! a cucumber that has a cucumber uh, garden that is bearing a lot of fruit. And I just wanted to share with you. It's an indication of uh, how we can adapt to an uh, undesirable change. Not everything is always bad. And it's upon us to, to, to turn things around and, uh, and turn it into a benefit. Uh, and so uh, today, um, because uh, of the pandemic, I was not able to travel to uh, uh, Hawaii as I had hoped. Uh, but uh, through this medium, uh, we're able to uh, carry on what we originally wanted to do. So I wish to, uh, first of all, thank the sponsors of the Utaba Bloom Lecture Series, uh, the Honolulu Betsuin Buddhist Temple, particularly to its president and the coordinator of this lecture, uh, Mr. Dexter Marr. Um, and so I also would like to express my heartfelt thanks and greetings to the Bloom family. I know Mrs. Dorothy Bloom has joined us. Uh, hello, Dorothy. And, um, and also to uh, Lily uh, Bloom Domingo, the daughter of um, uh, Dr. Bloom. So thank you for all that you have done to make this uh, lecture series possible. And I wanna send my personal uh, greetings to you. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, the Hompa Honganji Mission of Hawaii for all the years of support that they've given me, especially uh, in inviting me to many of the lectures uh, they have held. And um, actually the first um, lecture or talk that I did outside of California was in Hawaii at um, oh, 36 years ago when the first YES camp, uh, camp, camp was held. YES to, stands for Young Enthusiastic Shinshu Seekers that Reverend Sandra Hiramatsu uh, put together 36 years ago. And that was the start of many of my trips to Hawaii. And actually being a poor student that I was, a graduate student, and, and it, uh, that it allowed me to, um, and allowed myself and the family to uh, afford trips to a vacation um, by uh, hitching our vacation together with my speaking engagements. Also, Hawaii is a, a very important place for uh, the Tanaka family because uh, it was 120 years ago that um, my great grandfather uh, immigrated to Hawaii. That started our connection to the US and uh, we just had a grandson born in uh, California and he represent the, represents the sixth generation of the Tanakas in the US. And so Hawaii it holds a dear place in our hearts for the Tanaka family. So uh, I wish now to talk about Dr. Alfred Bloom, uh, who set up the, uh, the lecture, and for uh, he has meant a lot to me. Uh, as someone who was a, my boss for eight years uh, at the Institute of Buddhist Studies, he was the dean. I was a young junior faculty member. 
and we worked together very well. And I consider him not only my boss, but more as a comrade because we fought a lot of battles trying to actualize many of the ideals that were um, uh, set up as our mission for the Institute of Buddhist Studies. Uh, one of the things we did was to uh, uh, set up in, in a relationship with the a consortium of uh, uh, Christian and Jewish uh, seminaries and where we had students uh, from our institute go to their school and their students coming to our school. It's one of the very few, maybe it's almost the only one in the world where you have that kind of a, a setup between a Buddhist institution and a Christian uh, uh, in institution. Now, back to Dr. Bloom. Um, one day when we were working uh, in Berkeley, I got a call uh, in saying that he was in an accident, a uh, motor scooter accident. He was in the hospital. So uh, I was obviously concerned. Um, I, uh, I heard that he was, still, he was doing relatively okay. And so I knew it was not a, a life-threatening situation. But as I went to the hospital and approached his room, I could hear him mumbling, uh, mumbling some, you know, something that didn't make sense. He was talking to himself. So I thought, gee, maybe he hit his head and, and uh, it went a little cuckoo. Um, as I approached closer, I realized that he was uh, not mumbling, but he was reciting a sutra, a jusege, from the uh, larger Sukhavati Vyuha. Uh, Pure Land Sutra. And as I got closer and closer, I, um, I noticed that a line from the, the sutra, which actually is related to uh, today's talk and what he means to, uh, what relate, relates not only to the talk, but also to uh, uh, who he was as a scholar and as a minister. So I would like to share uh, what he was uh, reciting. And here is um, a line and it goes like this. Ishu kai hozo, which means I will open the storehouse of Dharma for all beings. So, um, this line really stuck out. And so what happened was that a few years later, um, I believe, uh, it was, I think it was after uh, this incident that we um, <clears throat> established or we, we put together a festschrift or a, um, uh, a book in honor of Dr. Bloom. And here he is, uh, obviously he was a little younger, um, engaged Pure Land Buddhism. And at, in the front of the book, uh, I had him uh, write, a, write Chinese characters. And this here, this is what he wrote. Ho Zhou, uh, dar, storehouse of Dharma. And that's his name, Alfred um, Bloom. And so uh, we have an original calligraphy from Dr. Bloom, which, uh, whose meaning is storehouse of Dharma, and, and which is in the line that he was uh, mumbling or chanting, Ishu uh, kai ho zo, I will open the storehouse of Dharma for all beings. So today's um, uh, theme is uh, passing the torch to the next generation. And so this is really apropos and relevant to what uh, I hope to talk about. So let me go back. And so um, uh, allow me to say a few words now uh, for um, a few about uh, the reasons why I wrote this book, uh, which is entitled Jewels, an introduction to American Buddhism for uh, Youth. Uh, 
scouts and the young in heart. Um, I should say that even though he says uh, American Buddhism, it will be, it will be relatively uh, relevant to uh, those of you who are from Canada. Um, actually, I hope uh, in the future to, to write one uh, specifically, specifically for the Canadian experience as well. So the first part of my talk, I'll talk about the book. And the second part, I shall talk more about uh, the, uh, the theme of passing the torch. So let me say a few words about why I wrote the book. Initially, I, wrote, uh, I was invited by the Buddhist Scouting Committee of the Buddhist Church of America, or the, the Boy Scouts of America, because there is a, a Buddhist uh, segment to it, and uh, it's run primarily from the Buddhist Church of America, and the Scouting Committee asked me to write something. So this was uh, 15 years ago, and it took a long, long time to finally complete it, so I'm very, very happy. Uh, also, uh, even though Buddhism has uh, seen a enormous growth, um, there, isn't, there aren't very many good books uh, for young people. And so uh, I felt that it was important that uh, we write something uh, that I, I contribute to the, the need for such a book uh, for youth and scouts and and I also include uh, Young at Heart, which means that it's also good for adults as well. In fact, I have a feeling that many more adults will read it uh, than youth. So um, also, um, I was a young Buddhist growing up in America, and I had my share of difficulties um, being a young Buddhist. And I felt that um, if I, I felt a need to contribute uh, to young Buddhists uh, uh, living in America, uh, trying to live as a, a Buddhist, which uh, often is not that easy. And um, so, and also it's not just for Buddhists. Uh, I'm hoping for that any young person or anyone young in heart uh, who are uh, interested in Buddhism can, um, access this book and find something to get started on. And so um, uh, also I wanted to write uh, a book uh, on Buddhist humor, but it turns out that I just didn't have enough uh, to, to come up with a book fully or specifically on Buddhist and humor. Uh, but I was able to weave this in to the book, and that is why in the title, um, in parenthesis, I have um, uh, with a bit of humor. So there you have it. And these are the reasons for uh, uh, writing this uh, book. Also, I should, I forgot to mention the fact that I, I had, the publisher is the BDK America. And um, the reason for going with this uh, publisher is that they are willing to make this book available free of a charge. And uh, that is uh, something that I think is important um, for making such a book available. And it's, uh, it's available in its uh, PDF form and uh, printed books will also be available free of charge to institutions when groups like church, temple, schools, when they order uh, the book, they will be able to receive them free of charge, including shipping. Okay, so I want to now start sharing my book. Um, by the way, uh, I want to... Um, uh, okay, so um, this is the the title, Jewels, and I will explain a little bit later why. And um, I have already talked about the sub, the, and in, the fact that it's primarily for youth and scouts, but also for um, uh, uh, adults as well, uh, if you are looking for an introductory level. Now, um, 
Here I have three endorsements, uh, one from a Stanford uh, student, uh, one from the chairman of the National Buddhist Committee. He has the same name as uh, mine, but he's not related. But here I want to point out the fact that here we have an endorsement from Reverend Tik Tulok, who is a sp uh, spiritual advisor for the Vietnamese Buddhist Youth Association. So uh, this book also will try to reach out to uh, other Buddhists, especially where there are young Buddhists and the Vietnamese Americans tend to be Buddhists, tend to be Buddhists. Um, and, and, and so that uh, uh, Reverend Tulok, who is a good friend of mine, uh, has agreed to uh, promote this amongst the, the Vietnamese American Buddhists. But again, uh, I would like any uh, people, any young people, whether they're Buddhists or not, to be able to read and look at this book. So uh, I wanted to explain the, the cover. This is Los Angeles, a peace march uh, led by Reverend uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. And as you can see here, you have these young people. Um, and I think it's a wonderful uh, image of American Buddhism uh, with all kinds of people representing the peoples of, uh, of America uh, on a peace march, a peace march which uh, symbolizes uh, engaged Buddhism. And uh, Buddhism is not just for the uh, the, the individual uh, well-being or the, the mental stability and, and peace of mind, but uh, it's, this symbolizes how Buddhism is for how to uh, uh, reach out to, to the uh, greater society. Okay, so I will now go to the text of the book and uh, Okay, this is the, uh, the book, and um, it's dedicated to the, uh, well, earlier, I think it's, okay. It's dedicated to the youth, uh, Buddhist youth and young adults on whose shoulders the future of American Buddhism rests. And um, it's divided into uh, three parts. Uh, part one, the legacy. The part two, the teachings. And part three, on daily life. And I think this is um, one of the, the uh, a special character, characteristic of, of this book is that I want to deal with the daily and everyday issues of the young people, especially chapter nine, to which I will turn a little bit later. Uh, it deals with the issues and problems of daily life. Okay, and, and I have appendices here uh, with important dates in Buddhism and Christianity, um, Buddhists in the world, various traditions in the U.S., and uh, number four is how to relate to people of other religions. Um, and then finally at the end, um, scouting, uh, Buddhist scouting in America, where there are different uh, merit badges and, and medals. Okay. So in the preface, here is this uh, humorous uh, uh, cartoon. Jesus is coming. And then there is a Buddhist guy, a monk, who says, Buddha, here now. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this once appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle when we were having the, uh, a conference of the Buddhist Christian Dialogue in, the, see, in 1998. And um, I think they knew the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper knew they were having a conference and they put this up and this became the topic of the conference. And this indicates the, the fact that Buddhism has arrived in America as one of the religions, though still only 1% of the population 
its impact is greater than that. And so I talk about how when I was growing up in the early 1960s that as a Buddhist, um, I felt compelled, I felt as, as I talked about a little early, earlier that little un uncomfortable being a Buddhist because uh, I think I write it here, uh, sorry, okay. Uh, Hmm. Oh, right, right around here. Um, uh, I talk about how, you know, in America, for uh, people in Japan and maybe in Brazil, you don't know that every morning we get up and we pledge allegiance to the flag. And there is a word called one nation under God. And when it came to God, I had difficulty saying, because I didn't believe in that kind of God. And so I tried keeping silent or... I keep silent uh, or quietly saying Buddha instead of God. Or oh, I would say God, but interpreting in my mind uh, Buddha. So the quandary that I experienced, the, the, the uncertainty, uh, was certainly there as a youth. And that is another reason why I wanted to um, you know, present the, this kind of book so that the young Buddhists can feel confident. Um, even though I said uh, Buddhism becoming more well-known, but still uh, uh, the Buddhist youth probably uh, would uh, face uh, reasons for not feeling confident or comfortable. And one way to deal with this is knowledge and conviction. And hopefully uh, this kind of book uh, will uh, help that in, in, in regard to that. Also, I wanted to express my uh, uh, appreciation and gratitude to the scouting from which I, uh, I benefit when I was young. And so when they asked me to write one, I really wanted to do that as a way of paying back to the, the scouting. Uh, uh, okay, so and here I have people, oh, um, once again, to, to, to reinforce the fact that this book um, is for all Buddhists. And so we have people representing the various Buddhist traditions endorsing this book. Okay. And is, uh, I wonder if Naho Umitani is here. I, um, maybe Naho is one of the young people who edited this book, uh, who looked at it, gave me some feedback. So um, I also acknowledge them up here, uh, people like Leah Chase, Harrison Chin, Joshua McKinney, Kelly and Sarah Matsumura, Naho Umitani, and Jason Yokoyama. I felt it was important to get some feedback from them because after all, I'm not young anymore, <laughs> even, though I think, even though I think I'm young. But um, so it was good to get uh, their uh, response. So, um, now, the, word, the topic, uh, the title of the book, Jewels, comes from um, what, two places in Buddhism. First, uh, which I had it in the back of my mind is the three jewels, you know, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. But in this book, I, have, I talk about outer jewel and inner jewel, okay? Outer jewel is what, as many of you know, uh, um, if you have studied Buddhism, the Indra's nettle jewels, which is a metaphor that is very popular, where you have uh, you know, a, a, a net extending in the sky and you have jewels at each of the eye. And each eye is not able to shine on its own. Why can it shine on its own? How is it possible? It's because they, it receives the illumination from other jewels around, around them. So it's a interdependent, interconnected relationship in which one is supported by others. At the same time, I can also shine and illuminate others. So it's not only passively receiving, but also actively uh, illuminating others. So uh, this 
uh, the, the notion of interdependence, interconnectedness is certainly the, one of the key, uh, the hallmarks of Buddhism as it is understood in America and in the West. So that's the outer jewel and the inner jewel is represented by this cartoon. Oh, by the way, um, the, the illustrations were done by a guy from um, Hawaii. His name is John Murakami. I've never met him, but he's been wonderful. I tell him, you know, what I want, and he came back with the, the appropriate uh, drawings. And sometimes we went back and forth several times, but this one, it took a little while to get it right. Uh, this is about how a friend, a soul, a jewel in the underlining of his uh, friend's jacket. This is the inner jewel. So it, 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 it's a symbol for how we, each of us, have a, a, a jewel within. We often call it Buddha nature, meaning that we all have the potential to become Buddhas or potential to be enlightened. And so um, this is a famous metaphor that comes from the Lotus Sutra, another uh, well-known Mahayana Sutra. So outer jewel, inner jewel, and that's where we get the jewel. So um, uh, if this is uh, uh, new for you, please um, uh, cherish these metaphors because uh, they're very helpful in trying to understand uh, Buddhism, not conceptually, but visually and, 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 uh, and image-wise. And, and, and the fact that we are illuminated by uh, various um, jewels that illuminate the, the, the light from the illumination from other jewels, but at the same time, we can illuminate others. And then within us, we each have a jewel. Okay, so uh, we are um, now part one. So we have another around 20 minutes for me to uh, go over the uh, major parts, you know, um, we certainly, um, so I want to highlight um, uh, certain things here. And, and the, the first one is that this book is unique, I think, in that as a book for young people, I have uh, two chapters specifically on Buddhism in America. Um, and, uh, and the first chapter is about uh, how Buddhism has grown 17-fold in the 40 years or 50 years. Um, and we, there are now, um, uh, well, right, right now we're talking about, uh, uh, right, right over here, about 3.2 million Buddhists in, in the U.S. And um, this is a, a, there is a fundamental change taking place in American religion. Actually, a number of Christians have de decreased from 91% uh, 50 years ago to 65% uh, as of last year. And, and this means that a lot of people are becoming non-affiliated with uh, churches. And, and so um, it's important to, for relig people involved in religion to know that especially young people are not as uh, inclined to, uh, eager to join institutions. So another point I, I uh, here, I start out by explaining how Buddhism is one of the three world religions. Most people know that, but a lot of people still don't know. Um, that Buddhism is, uh, along with Christianity and Mus uh, Muslim or Islam, uh, Buddhism is the, one of the three world religions. It's the smallest in terms of population, but it's the longest, it's the oldest by 500 years, um, older than Christianity and 1,100 years older than Islam. I, I mentioned this not to, um, um, mostly to give Buddhist youth a confidence that their religion is not some, you know, uh, uh, Asian cult where people simply stare at each other's belly buttons by meditating. I mean, that's the kind of image that I grew up when I was in the 1960s. That's 
image that people had of Buddhism. But um, with knowledge, we learned that it is a world religion. And this is another example of how I wish to have a Buddhist youth have confidence in their religion. And uh, I talk about Buddhism uh, in America, uh, different uh, dimensions of Buddhism, uh, features of Buddhism, various kinds. Uh, this is a gathering in Los Angeles at a, a, a inter-Buddhist uh, gathering celebrating the birth of the Buddha. And um, here are the pioneer Buddhists from Asia, including Dalai Lama in the middle, uh, which, by the way, I think his presence, uh, his Dalai Lama uh, has had an enormous impact of, in making Buddhism uh, popular uh, or known in America. Here are Joro Shinshu kids at the uh, um, Mormon temple in Utah. There are three young Americans who uh, became ordained with the uh, Shilai temple in Los Angeles. Here is a gathering at um, Berkeley, uh, Berkeley Zen Center uh, on, at a Sunday service. There's a young man attending a Buddhist service. And here is another a young man doing, uh, 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 celebrating the birth of the Buddha. Uh, so, um, and now uh, one or two, uh, many people know that they're unlike in the past, uh, we have famous people who are Buddhists, including Richard Gere here in the middle. Uh, and I don't have a picture, but Tiger Woods is a Buddhist and a number of other people. And there are people who are almost Buddhist, like Phil Jackson, the basketball coach, and of course, um, Steve, the late Steve Jobs, um, whom uh, we call Nystand Buddhist. Um, so um, here is a, a, at the Zen Center in Berkeley, uh, ladies uh, preparing the shrine. Uh, typical meditation, ses meditation session belonging to the Rinzai School. Okay, so um, uh, this is one aspect of Buddhism that is, uh, has been emphasized in America, that is engaged Buddhism, that Buddhism engages in concerns and matters of the world. Here, uh, Buddhist priests uh, walking on um, Golden, Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, uh, protesting the treatment of Buddhists in Burma. And if you can't see it here, it says no Olympics, no human rights, no Olympics. So this is a little before 19, uh, 2008, uh, Beijing uh, Olympics. Uh, they were protesting the fact that uh, without human rights, you shouldn't have uh, Olympics. So these are some examples of how Buddhists are speaking out on matters of the world. And one other point I want to point out here, there are four women priests. So that's another hallmark, especially of the convert Buddhists in America, how um, they are, um, there are, how there are many women priests uh, in the leadership, which is uh, unlike the situation in, in, in Asia. Okay. So another uh, uh, Buddhist humor that some of you know, this is classic American Buddhist humor. Why couldn't the Buddha vacuum under his sofa? Because he had no attachments. And I like the illustration here. Okay, so um, this is the Shilai Temple in Los Angeles, probably the largest temple uh, in North America, and Spirit Rock in uh, Inside Meditation West. This doesn't look like a temple in Asia, although um, the, the, it's modeled after Southeast Asian architecture, but it's in the, set in the hills of California hills. So it's um, markedly or notedly an, an American um, uh, Buddhist scene. 
And here's Dalai Lama at the Central Park speaking in front of 5,000, 10,000 people. And this is the indication of his influence in American Buddhism. Okay, so let me just go quickly to um, uh, life. I have chapter two, chapter four, uh, Life of the Buddha. Um, it's, uh, it's nothing unique, but uh, because of the help of John uh, Murakami, I like some of these um, sceneries where this is that famous um, incident in, in his youth. As a very sensitive man, a uh, boy, he sat in the garden of his palace, and as he was watching uh, the farmers till the land, the, a worm popped up. Then all of a sudden, a little a bird came and grabbed the worm. And then a large bird came and grabbed the little bird. And so here you have a Buddha um, kind of uh, uh, crying because, or feeling sad that why do creatures have to kill one another? So this is an indication that he was a sensitive child and which then eventually led him to become, um, uh, eventually led him to leave the castle in search of truth, to find uh, 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 answers to the, to the suffering of the world. And so I'm gonna skip this and I have these illustrations uh, uh, some paintings here is when he was um, before he became enlightened, but in his ascetic life when he was um, uh, in training, but unable to find a breakthrough, an answer to his uh, quest. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to skip. Now, chapter two has to do with history of Buddhism throughout Asia, and, uh, and then, then the following chapter, Brief History of Buddhism in America. And um, I think that it's important uh, for people to know when Buddhism began in America. It began quite early, as, as early as 1844, and Buddhism that came not from Asia, but via, through Europe. So it's more of the intellectual Buddhism. And then later the Chinese immigrants brought Buddhism to the West Coast and started a temple uh, in eight, 1852, um, uh, 53, yeah. And, and then uh, actually there were about 400 temples or buildings that, which were like temples on the West Coast, 400 of them in the late uh, 19th century. People don't know that. And then, um, then later the Japanese uh, came and which, which strengthened Buddhism and through the, through the, the war. And so we have all this, uh, uh, so important events in American Buddhist history. Here's a, a reference to in 1942, Reverend Issei Matsuru, a Jodo Shinshu priest, is arrested and later placed in internment camp along with 110,000 Japanese Americans, of whom 60% were Buddhist. So um, this is an important part of history of Buddhism. Recently, there was is, has been a book written by Duncan Williams called American Sutra. And uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, please do look at it. It's an important book about uh, uh, Buddhism in America. And here is um, Dalai Lama receiving the gold medal in 2007 uh, in front of the president, speaker of the house, and the, the head of the Senate. So this is symbolic of how Buddhism has arrived in America uh, when you have a Buddhist priest receiving a medal. Of course, you know, he's not just a Buddhist priest, but he's head, titular head of the Tibetan people. Okay, so um, bear with me about 10 more minutes or a little less than that. Um, second part, this is a part two. This is the 
were have the teachings, and um, I wanted to uh, make reference to point out that I first talk about the four noble truths, of course, of course, but the example that I use is Aesop's fable of greedy dog. Many of you know Aesop's fable. And rather than using a story from the, from the East or from Asia, I thought that uh, it would be better to use a story that uh, American uh, young people should know, um, uh, Aesop tales and the story of the greedy dog. And I use this story as a way of talking about the Four Noble Truths. So this happened uh, throughout the history of Buddhism or any world religions, because where, wherever Buddhism went, it took the, um, the, the stories from that area and made it more meaningful. And this is one of the lessons that uh, I think that can be gleaned from not only this book, but others that in order to make sense to people who are reading it, we have to uh, use the materials and stories and thinking of, of that well, indigenous people, uh, the native, uh, native in a sense of people who are already uh, in, in that land. And so, uh, and uh, I think the rest um, is, it's quite uh, straightforward. And, um, and this one is one that uh, is, symbolizes uh, how we talk about Buddhism and another humor. And all of you, some of you I'm sure know this um, humor. Uh, it's the hot dog humor. And the monk, uh, the first part goes like this. The monk goes to a hot dog vendor and the vendor says, what would you like, sir? And the, 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 um, and the, the monk says to the vendor, make me one with everything. Now, I, I don't have time to explain, <laughs> but uh, it should be funny. Everything meaning, I guess I will explain that, you know, everything on it with, you know, radish and, and mustard and, and sauerkraut and all that. But he's also saying, make me one with everything, meaning in tune with everything, the spiritual experience. Okay, the second part is here. So he gives him $20 and, and he doesn't get his change from the vendor. So he's getting a little antsy and says, where is my change? And the vendor says this, sir, the change must come from within you. Ta -da. <laughs> of course, this change is not the money change, but the internal transformation, right? Inside, which is all about. And I want to point out one thing here. Um, in the world today, especially in advanced countries, we are seeing a change in the paradigm or the makeup of religion. And, and I, I call it, um, and some pe people call it spirituality, um, but I, I say we are making a shift from a re religion of belief to religion of awakening, religion of awakening. And, and so for those who f feel, um, who agree with that kind of a new kind of religion, a religion awakening, Buddhism, uh, makes sense to a lot of people. And that's one of the reasons why um, Buddhism is growing, not, you know, uh, uh, huge, but uh, little by little, uh, it's making inroads into uh, Western culture, not only America, but uh, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, in the Europe, as well as uh, North you know, Canada. Um, okay, so, um, I think um, I'm going. What I'm going to want to do, if I can do this, is I want to share. Since we have people from uh, Japan, 
uh, as well. I want to uh, give them a flavor of Hawaii because uh, right now you're not getting much of anything Hawaiian. And if I can um, share this video that Dexter Marr and his people made, it's, it's about how the Buddhists, the, the Joro Shinshu Buddhists in Hawaii are uh, responding to the coronavirus and the pandemic by expressing gratitude uh, to the care, caregivers, uh, the doctors and the nurses and uh, the medical people. The ringing of the temple bell in Buddhism is a deep and sacred ritual steeped in ancient tradition. The temple bell you hear represents the gratitude and deep appreciation of the members and friends of the Hompahonganji Mission of Hawaii throughout the state of Hawaii. To all healthcare workers, first responders, police officers, firefighters, and to all the businesses who are tirelessly working so that we may continue to safely live during this corona pande pandemic, and often at the expense of their own safety and well-being. We ring the bell to honor our government workers, the governor, and the mayors of our counties as well. Namu Amida Butsu.
Aloha from Lihui Honganji. On behalf of all of us, I want to thank healthcare workers, firefighters, police, EMTs, and all those who help to maintain the cleanliness and the safety of our hospitals and clinics. We're filled with gratitude for their many sacrifices during this pandemic. As the Buddhist concept of interdependence says, we are all in this together and we will all get through this together. Please stay safe and thank your local healthcare workers and first responders and keep them in our, your thoughts. Thank you, mahalo. So uh, mahalo, uh, for those of you who don't know, mahalo means thank you. And uh, uh, I think Dexter was also involved in it. It's a one, I, I liked it because um, when Dexter showed that to me, I, I felt that uh, it expresses the kind of the, the, the uh, Buddhist spirit, uh, Hawaii spirit, um, uh, not since we are uh, Honolulu, Betsuin is sponsoring this. I thought it was good to uh, see a bit of uh, uh, the sponsors, uh, sponsor of this uh, program. Okay, okay, so why don't we, uh, uh, it's been an hour and I uh, question and answer and discussion for a while. A uh, question it says, in yeah. the meanwhile, see, how is Shin Buddhism distinctly different from other sects or schools of Buddhism? What makes it unique? Hmm. All right. Okay, I want to, the question was, what makes Shin Buddhism uh, unique uh, compared to other, other schools of Buddhism? And one is that the founder of uh, Shin Buddhism was Shinran, and 800 years ago, uh, he was once a monk, but he married and had a family. And so uh, that makes him unique, uh, especially in Japan and also within the, um, within the, within all of Buddhism. Um, so ever since the priests of Shin Buddhism have been married, and that makes it quite different. Um, it's often uh, 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 compared to uh, Martin Luther, the founder of Protestant uh, Christianity. And, and the other, the second one is doctrinal. Often it is said, you know, Jodo Shinshu people too, pride themselves in saying that we are other powered uh, with a religion of other power and not self power. Uh, in other words, the salvation comes from uh, the rooted in Amida Buddha and not in ourselves. Uh, so, um, but however, I think in, uh, in my, own, my view that especially Mahayana Buddhism has a strong element of other power um, that ultimately salvation or uh, enlightenment, awakening comes from beyond the self. In other words, other power. And, and so, uh, though, so it's not, it is not true that uh, Jodo Shinshu is only other, uh, only Jodo Shinshu is other power and others are not. And what I'm saying is that other uh, schools of Buddhism are, are other powered. It's just that I would say that Shin Buddhism goes to the extreme of emphasizing other power. We call it radical other power, extreme other power. So, uh, and we don't have a, a particular uh, practice. We don't emphasize meditation, but we do emphasize effort. It doesn't mean we do nothing that, that the Shin Buddhists also listen, study, uh, and, and, and aspire to understand the teachings. So um, uh, on the other hand, we can, we can engage in all kinds of practices as long as you, we don't say, I am the cause of awakening. 
that I am making this, I'm doing this, you know, that becomes egotistical, and which is true for any religion, Buddhism otherwise. So that's my answer to the question of what makes Shin Buddhism unique. Okay, he has also a follow-up question about, um, let's see, what makes Shinran Shonen a unique leader? Oh, okay. Um, what makes Shinran a unique leader? Uh, well, I, I, in a way, it's basically uh, unique in a sense. I think it comes down to the fact that um, uh, he got married even though he was no longer a regular monk, he continued to live a life of a monk in a sense of wanting to share the teaching, today's theme of passing the torch. And so he, uh, he specifically began to promote his understanding amongst the ordinary people. And that is why uh, he uh, uh, garnered, he, he uh, formed a following and which then became the largest uh, denomination in terms of number in Japanese Buddhism. So I'll stop at that. Okay. Any other? Uh, you, you? Yeah, uh, Ken, uh, Rod yeah. Maruyama asks, uh, he, he says, I like the approach of focusing on the youth to convey Buddhism. One of the challenges we have is reaching the next generation. How should we answer the under God phrase of the Pledge of Allegiance when children ask us? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think um, um, under God, you know, that, that so um, in Buddhism, we don't have a God that created, a creator God or God that punishes, but especially the creator God. Um, but if God uh, in a Judeo-Christian tradition represents love, um, we have love uh, in Buddhism. Uh, we call it compassion, compassion of the Buddha. So in all Mahayana Buddhism and also in Theravada Buddhism, uh, Southern Buddhism, that there is uh, an emphasis on compassion that um, enlightened people, awakened people, um, exude and, and uh, promote uh, and have a deep sense of compassion. So uh, we can say that, um, uh, for example, in the Jodo Shinshu tradition, we have Amida. And Amida is like God, but it's not God um, as in a creator God, but Amida is a, represents the compassionate force in our lives. So uh, if God means compassion, then we have uh, Amida Buddha or other Buddhas, Dharmakaya, the Vairochana Buddha, all these different kinds of Buddhas that represent uh, compassion. So we can say, when someone asks, um, do you believe in God? And I would say, yes. Um, we believe in God of compassion and love, and we call, call that Buddha in different forms. But um, not a God that created the universe, uh, creator God. So I think we can, so we should, I, I wouldn't, re, you know, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't recommend saying we, we don't believe in God. If, if you want to be tactful and, and, and um, have people understand you, we believe in God, but our God, uh, Buddha, is a symbol, uh, represents love and compassion. I hope that, um, is it that people cannot uh, speak, Dexter? I am trying to unmute them now. So yeah. I think I have uh, uh, Daniel Heslop um, on voice. So, Daniel, okay, Daniel, can you speak? Can you hear me? You're soft. I'm soft. I'll get closer to my mic. Can you? I'm a musician, so I have flexible mics here. Oh. Is that better? Hello. Yeah, okay. Louder. Okay, now I can hear you better. 
Okay. So um, my question was that given the emphasis on general Buddhism in yeah. Can you talk about mixed practice? And what I mean by that is uh, Nembutsu and meditation. Uh, Shan Dao, for example, seemed to be opposed to this. Um, but it seems like today, as you mentioned, religion is becoming more about awakening rather than faith. Do you feel that meditation and Nembutsu are compatible? Um, yeah, well, um, yeah, Nembutsu... Nembutsu is a form of meditation. Um, so, you know, we have uh, Shila, the precepts, meditation, and wisdom. These are the three trainings. And so, um, uh, uh, so the meditation part is often the sitting meditation, but uh, recitative, me recitative uh, Nembutsu, well, by Nembutsu, if you mean recitation, um, yeah, uh, recitative nembutsu, if it's done in a proper mindset of for, uh, simply expressing gratitude for the fact that um, I am embraced in the compassion of Amida, then uh, it is a, a, a form of meditation and it leads to the calming of the mind. And so um, uh, I think that uh, nembutsu is... Um, and uh, is a me meditative practice. In fact, in the olden days, uh, in, the, in China and earlier period, uh, recitation, uh, well, uh, uh, yeah, the, the recitation was considered a form of um, meditation. It, yes. Okay. I don't know if, if that um, answers your question. Yeah, and I, as you know that uh, when I visited uh, Canada and Northwest, uh, uh, the U.S. recently, I have been emphasizing the importance of, um, for Jodo, Jodo Shin Buddhists, uh, a kind of a, a, a meditative form of uh, contemplating on the... Uh, various forces and people who make up our lives. Uh, I call it the contemplate, Nembutsu contemplation or Nembutsu meditation. And so we think about, Nen means to think on. We think, contemplate on these various people and events that make up our lives. And ultimately it's Amida Buddha, but we have to contemplate in a quiet way uh, because we are too concerned about the worldly things, but we have to take time to contemplate and to direct our mind toward that. And so by doing so, we are engaged in what we normally call the meditation. The, the biggest importance is not to think that by meditating, that causes the enlightenment. That's the you know, self-powered attitude. But... I will say no Buddhist, either if it's Theravada or other Mahayana schools, will consider um, thinking those terms. That when, when people awaken to a, a truth or have some insight, it's often very uh, an attitude of humility that, you know, I am not the one uh, causing this, but I'm embraced by a greater force including the parents and friends and society that, that make uh, my lives possible. Okay, anyone else? So next we have Miriam who would like to ask a question. Yeah, hi. Uh, earlier in at the sort of introductory stage of your talk, you mentioned that um, there was a development in um, American Buddhism where uh, Buddhist, uh, I, I didn't remember, recall which organization, Buddhist organizations, started um, interacting with interfaith uh, Jewish and Christian organizations, and you said that objections were raised, but you didn't specify what objections were raised and by whom, and I was just curious about who, who had a bone to pick with anybody about that. Uh, oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, we're talking about the Institute of Buddhist Studies. 
uh, the, uh, the, the graduate school uh, affiliated with the Jodo Shinshu tradition in Berkeley, California. And I worked there for 10 years. I'm also a graduate of that program. And so when I began to work, I became an assistant professor and, and also assistant dean. And at that time, we were trying to um, set up a situation where we um, uh, uh, have exchanges of students and classes and units and all that. Okay, so the objection came from our, our own organization, the, uh, I would call it those who are conservative, thinking that um, uh, we, we need not necessarily affiliate ourselves in that way with the, with, uh, the other religions. But, you know, uh, and, and also, to be honest, uh, it, it was also political, too, in that certain faction did, didn't, didn't agree with the, uh, the, the, the bishop at the time um, or the, the direction of the Institute of Buddhist Studies. Uh, so um, that, ha that happens in any organization. You have the progressives and the conservatives, and, and the objection came from the conservatives. And I had a, a follow-up that's not exactly related, but it just came out of your discussion about the, how to talk about God. Yes. Um, I was drawn to Buddhism because it came from a secular Jewish background. And uh -huh. uh, I have no problem telling people that I don't believe in God, but I don't care what you think. You know, you're entitled to think whatever you like. Yeah. And uh, actually, the person who helped me figure out how to speak about it without, you know, breaking down a lot of fences was uh, Reverend Koyo Kobose. He said something about, um, don't, you don't have to use the word atheist, but you can say non-theistic, mm -hmm. which means that there's, whether there is a God or not is not really the subject matter of the Buddha Dharma, mm -hmm. you know, and that it's what people experience and how they experience things that yeah. makes them determine for themselves very personally what they think about God. And I know that it sounds complicated, but I find that it's much better than like telling people that uh, the Buddha is a god, because mm. not everybody sees the Buddha that way. And I would rather not, you know, convey something that could become a misconception. Yeah, and I would just rather just very plainly say, you know, you know, there may be gods we don't know. The, in the Buddha's time, he actually did converse with gods, um, but this is personal, and Buddhism to my way of understanding it is non-theistic. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I think that's fine. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I think that's the way to talk about it. And, but uh, it's, it's, I was trying, the, my particular response had to deal with, uh, if you want to, for those who believe in God, if you want to maintain some kind of a, a connection, um, and especially for Buddhist youth uh, who's, um, living in a, you know, uh, Judeo-Christian culture uh, to simply say, there is no God. It would be, and if they don't have an ability to respond and have a knowledge to respond, then uh, it would be better to, to have some bridge there. And obviously, as you develop yourself in terms of understanding, then you can come up with your, your, uh, your strong opinion. So, um, um, uh, but but one thing is uh, important to note that there is maybe not so much in uh, Theravada Buddhism, but uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, uh, uh, that there is an affirmation of the existence of a a, a loving force or uh, a, a compassionate force or uh, a force or spiritual spiritual working that embraces us. And the, that, that is a, a, a fact uh, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism. And, but again, it's not a, a creator God. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, depending on the kid audience that you're talking about, but I think anybody over the age of 10 can handle the conversation. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had a deal with it when I was seven. Mm -hmm. So oh, okay. I, I think it's altogether possible that, that it's not necessary to tweak it in such a way as we step into it gradually and say, well, yeah, Buddha is kind of a god. 
uh, because that that's, that just sort of creates this whole other tension that comes up where people say, oh, well, then you're a pagan hmm. and well, you're going to hell, you know, because you get that right back if you say that, yeah. you know, if you, if you say, I believe that Buddha has this God feeling to him. You know, yeah. that's when kids get, you know, slammed by their peers for saying, oh, you're going to hell. And that mm. happens a lot. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, um, I, I also affirm what you're saying. And uh, I think there are different ways of dealing with it. And uh, I, I have a section, chapter um, 10, where I have uh, question and answers uh, on, on some of these questions. And uh, uh, so maybe you can take a look at it and let me know. If, oh, I, I'd love to, because I'm dealing with children now, you know, and I, I you know, I, I still get this sort of conversation with this and my, my peers are giving me a hard time. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, just trying to give this, I think this will be a great valuable tool for them. Yeah. So this is a good, great example of, uh, for those, uh, for those of you from Japan, this is something that there, that you don't have to face uh, in Japan. Uh, but here, uh, here in, in the U.S., that uh, situation is different. So I hope this is a, uh, an interesting moment for you to, to realize that um, uh, there are different needs uh, that uh, uh, we have in other parts of the world uh, with regard to how to talk about Buddha. Good. Miriam, good, good, good point. Thanks. Okay. Can uh, I question? Before we go to break, I, I want to get into uh, a question that Penny Atchison has. And she says, thank you for writing and sharing your book. Uh, sorry, I haven't read it yet, but I wonder if you have suggestions for older folks to assist younger folks to explore and perhaps embrace Buddha's, Buddhist values uh, besides reading the book. Yeah. Well, I talk, actually, that's the object of my second part. Uh, but I think modeling you know, uh, you become the model for um, what Buddhism is. And, um, and pe you know, kids look at, uh, in Japan, they have a phrase that they look at your back. You know, in other words, not what you say only, but how you act. And that's how they learn. So that, that, that's the uh, one approach. But, but uh, basically, uh, do whatever you can to empower them. Uh, I think there are young people at the churches or temples, and they want to do things, but sometimes the, the adults don't allow them to explore and do things that they're interested in. So uh, empowering them to do uh, things, to learn the teachings and to share the teachings. Um, so I think also uh, talking about uh, their feelings and thoughts about the religion at home, you know, at dinner and at, during the meals. Um, how often do people really talk about uh, religious matter? Uh, it doesn't have to be religious matter, but life in general on a deeper level. Not just talking about, you know, whether the, the San Francisco Giants won, won the baseball game or whatever, talking about sports and, 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 and politics. <coughs> But uh, we can also talk about um, uh, religion or Buddhism in a personal way. And I think um, uh, that will go a long ways. And also, uh, when I said uh, people are watch uh, the kids are watching you, is that, you know, when you do a certain simple things, like when you, when you um, before meal, you put your hands together and express gratitude for the food that you're partaking. I mean, um, so, so, you, so basically, if you are living it uh, sincerely and honestly, and sometimes by honestly, sometimes we don't live up to the expectation, but that's okay. You know, you do what you can to live in sincerely and honestly. And then, um, and other than that, you know, having conversations and taking people, uh, your kids to temples and other activities. Um, um, you know, and showing them books and sharing books together. Um, I mean, th those are the best ways. But, you know, it, it's not often easy talking to your own kids about religion. And, and, and that's why uh, how you act probably has a more profound impact than what you tell them uh, or what you tell them to do. So that's my response. 
Okay, and the, and the final question for this, this segment what goes to Linda Nagai. Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you. I, I was laughing at your, your little comics and it kind of left me, but you mentioned the data regarding the Christ Christians that the younger ones or people are going away from traditional or organizational religion. Yeah. So that's probably happening in um, our Buddhism, Jodo Shinshu also. So yeah. how, how do we reach out to them without having them coming to temple or, you know, all of these things that they probably don't want to do? You know, there's got to be a way. Do you have any ideas how we can do that? Well, the, <clears throat> I mean, if you, if you, but basically we have to accept the fact that the world is changing. People are probably you know, um, let's let just say people still, especially in North America, people, young people too, think about religion and consider religion important, but they're not, they don't have the time or the wherewithal to attend churches and institutions. So 40%, almost 40% of ages 40 and younger are no longer affiliated. That, that, that's an astonishing change from, you know, 50 years ago when only 1% was, uh, were un, unaffiliated. So uh, that we, I think we just have to accept the, the, that for now uh, things are changing in that way. That doesn't mean that the, the people are, uh, even the young people are not interested in religion. Many of them say, you know, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual, but not religious, you know. We call it NRBS, not religious but spiritual, or we call them nons. So I think what we can do are, you know, if you're, gonna, if you're talking about the activities, that um, um, empowering them to have their own activities. You know, uh, in California, I know there are like techno Buddhas and, and younger groups getting together. But another activity that I think of is actually, uh, you know, like a, uh, 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 traveling together, um, many of the uh, 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 successful tours take kids from the U.S. to Japan to visit uh, the, the Buddhist countries, uh, Buddhist uh, temples and, and facilities, and they travel together and, and they meet each other and, and they galvanize and they become lifelong friends. And uh, so I think doing things together, it could be like campouts and things like that. If you're talking about activities, uh, for many years, I did these uh, youth programs, you know, at IBS where we have young people come together and many of them didn't want to come because they were forced to come. But after two weeks, they were crying and, and they, they didn't want to leave each other because <laughs> it was such a great time. So I think that um, uh, in terms of activities, uh, activities not just to come for a large conference for one day, but actually spend time together. In fact, uh, one of the reasons why I, I decided to go into Buddhism was that I spent a whole month at the Institute of Buddhist Studies at the summer session in 1969. There were uh, 12, 12 young people from all over the U.S., and of the 12, I think 10 became ministers. Wow. And many of them served, and I'm one of them. And even though I have left BCA, but I'm still, you know, doing what I can. But it's because of the camaraderie that we develop, the bond that we develop. And especially amongst young people, um, you know, that is the uh, 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 a motivating force to be connected. You know, religion by itself for, is a, not a great motivator for a whole lot of people. In any given time, I always say that only 10% of the people population are seriously interested in religion or pursuing religion. But other people get involved in religion for other factors, you know, like social and uh, culture, for food, and all these other re reasons. So we have to think of different ways of uh, making uh, the, the pure teachings interesting, interesting. Um, through other means, like, you know, going on trips together and, and spending time together. Thank you. Okay, so it's a little bit past 2.30, so let's, uh, let's go to yeah. break. The topic of 
this seminar, this lecture, was uh, passing the torch to the next generation. And originally, I had lessons to be, lessons to be learned from the book. But uh, I have changed it, and maybe Dexter, we want to make sure that uh, I'm going to change it to lessons I, le I learned from writing the book. Uh, because uh, I felt it was too presumptuous to say that lessons we can learn from the book. But I learned something in writing the book uh, about uh, passing the torch. And so um, um, I wanted to emphasize that as we pass the torch, uh, either with our younger generation or with the larger society, I said to the next generation, but actually uh, we're talking about passing it to the, uh, our kids and grandkids, but also to our fellow members of a larger community who then will be able to pass it on down to the next generation. So it's spatially this way, and then time-wise. So uh, please keep note of that. So um, the lesson that I learned, uh, uh, I have written about that on page, um, let's see. But, okay, uh, you don't, um, this is what happens, I can't find it now, but um, the three things. What we need as we pass down, pass the torch is within us, as one, sense of confidence. Um, uh, confidence in the religion. Um, otherwise, you know, how can you pass, sh sh share it to others? Uh, maybe uh, being, we often say proud, we should be proud of our religion. We are proud of our religion, but that has, there has to be some substance to it. So we ourselves need to be confident by having conviction and knowledge. And the same goes with the next generation. Secondly is uh, uh, joyful. Joyful. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes Buddhism is seen as uh, somewhat pessimistic because we often talk about suffering, dukkha. But remember, dukkha is just the start. That's the kicker. That's the, the initiator. And as we go through the teachings and, and, and learn the teachings and apply it to our lives, then we become joyful. We become happy. Of course, we're not always joyful all the time, but fundamentally joyful. And our sangha should be joyful and having fun. And I think uh, bone dance is kind of exemplifies that. You know, people are having fun. And, and, but that not just at the summertime, but throughout the year. So when people look at Buddhist temple and say, or Buddhist sangha and say, hey, they look like they're having fun. You know, they're joyful. You know, so uh, if we're joyful, um, then that will be contagious. You know, others will see that and say, oh, I want some of that too. But that has to be, that has to come from within, which means you have to know the teachings and be able to willing to share. So that's the second one. And the last one is a word called relevant, relevant, R-E-L-E-V-A-N-T. We used to say that a lot in the 1960s. Uh, actually, when I was a young Buddhist uh, in the Buddhist Church of America, I was a national YBA president, and Reverend Kobata, who uh, is a good friend of mine who, who's a minister at San Francisco, we were the young radicals, you know. We had our long hair, we wore our army jackets, and we, we, we went to the Buddhist Church of America board meeting representing the young people. And they say, well, what do you want to do? And we said, well, we have this program that we want to hire uh, uh, you know, represent, you know, like about six young people in a different di district, and they'd be paid, and they can kind of facilitate activities for the young people. And we call it Relevant American Buddhists. We call it RAB, R-A-B. So we had the word relevant. And um, 
that was the, uh, and, and, and it had some impact. Uh, we hired people, you know, young people, not for much, a lot of money, but there we were filled with idealism. One of the reasons why I went into Buddhism is, well, there are two reasons. One is my existential quest to overcome fear of death and impermanence. Um, you know, I was afraid to die, like many people, and what this life is about. And, um, and Buddhism seemed to provide an answer for that. So that's the existential part. But the other part had to do with more social. Uh, as a product of the 1960s, I wanted to use my religion to change the world. You know, we used to say, change the world. And uh, we were very idealistic. And that, <clears throat> that was one of my motivations. So, relevant. Uh, going back to the word relevant. So uh, I, I feel that in whatever we do, uh, well, in, in the book, I, I try to make it relevant uh, to the younger people um, uh, by, you know, citing stories that they know already, not always stories from Asia. Uh, you know, that's being relevant. And chapter 10, which I didn't have chance to go over very carefully, or chapter 9, uh, has uh, 10 different uh, issues and problems of the young people, including, you know, losing a loved one. Um, I just lost my uh, mother of 90, almost 98 years old uh, in San Francisco. And um, uh, I wasn't able to go back because of the, the pandemic. Uh, so I was not able to attend the funeral. But um, uh, so, you know, in a way, I'm still kind of going through the mourning period, but because of Buddhism and the fact that she lived till 98, that, you know, it's nothing to really feel down about. Uh, you know, we should celebrate. In fact, we had a, a Zoom uh, funeral memorial service of sort. We call it a celebration uh, to, with, with our relatives, uh, in, you know, all over the world. And, and um, we celebrate it. But uh, behind that, I understand because of Buddhism that we all have to go sometime. You know, we all know that in the head, but Buddhism helps you to, to, uh, to appreciate that. And all the more, uh, we try to live every day fully because of that. You know, uh, the originally impermanence for monks and nuns, you know what the message was? Because everything is changing don't get attached, right? Don't get attached. And you, you do meditation, you do precepts to, to train your mind to become not attached. But for householders like us, that's impossible. Our life itself is full of attachment. Marriage is attachment. It's an epitome of attachment. So, you know, um, so what we do, you turn that around, and because of its change, we live, everything is changing. Of course, not to be too attached to the past, not attached to the future, but to, to, to relish, to appreciate the now, every moment as much as possible. Of course, you know, for many of us who are Jodo Shinshi, we are all ordinary foolish beings. So we cannot live it fully, but that's okay. That is okay. Knowing that's, that's a giving, that's like the constitution. It's a giving. So when you cannot live up to the, the ideals, it's all right, you know. And then they go back and try to uh, aspire that. But ultimately, in all Mahayana Buddhism especially, and Buddhism in general, that we are embraced in the compassion. Um, compassion. So everything in the end will be fine. So that, that perspective is important. Okay, so those three things as we pass the torch, confidence, being joyful, and being relevant. Um, and so, um, if you have the, the uh, outline, we're on page, um, oh, this one doesn't have an outline, okay. Well, um, a, just to, uh, again, to go over a little bit of, as we pass the torch of Buddhism, Actually, we're in a very good situation, very good time. If you're gonna, if we're gonna pass the torch uh, uh, in in North America, 
it's a good time now because Buddhism has a positive evaluation by people in America. There was a research, uh, a survey done in 2003, um, and, um, and it asked, um, uh, what do you think of Buddhism? And uh, is Buddhism to is a toler tolerant religion? And 56% of the people said yes. Well, you may say, well, you know, 40, 44% didn't say, say it, but still 56% is a pretty good high number. And peace loving, 63%. And um, um, that, that is a positive. And, and then finally, do you welcome the presence of Buddhism in the USA? And 60% or 56% said yes. So that as a religion, uh, it is something that is thought high, uh, relatively high, highly. And so, um, you know, uh, it's not like 50 years ago when, as I said, even I had the image myself that Buddhism is an Asian cult um, where people uh, meditate by staring at, staring at each other's navel. You know, uh, I don't know where I got that, but I, you know, I got it because, you know, I'm a product of society. And, uh, you know, it's, it's idolatrous and all that. But now uh, we have, you know, uh, Tiger Woods uh, is a Buddhist. Richard Gere is a Buddhist, you know. I mean, I think that uh, Steve Jobs, uh, have you listened to uh, his speech? Uh, at uh, Stanford in 2005. If you haven't, you should go to the uh, uh, internet and just uh, look up Steve Jobs' graduation speech. And you have a 15-minute speech in which he lays down three things, and one of which is on death. And you can clearly tell that that comes from his Buddhist background. Because, you know, he meditated for a long time, uh, especially in his 20s. And uh, his, he has a positive attitude or, yeah, attitude towards death. And just think about it. He's given a graduation speech to a bunch of 22-year-olds. And one of the things he talks about is death, you know? I mean, you, you would, ordinary, ordinary Americans wouldn't do that. But he did it because of, I think, of his Buddhist background. And so um, uh, that's something to note. So that you can see how Buddhism has uh, kind of seeped into American culture in different ways, especially with regard to death. Um, and there are uh, other aspects of death. And simply put, death, um, seen, what I think the best way to talk about it is, you know the famous story called Freddy the Leaf? Freddy the Leaf, written by Leo Bascaglia, that, when I first read it, I said, gee, this cannot be written by a professor from Southern California who's a Catholic. And it turns out that mid-age, he became interested in Buddhism. He even spent some time in Kyoto. So he studied uh, Buddhism and especially noted the, the understanding of death, which is reflected in that story, that one, death is natural. It is not a punishment. It's not a failure, you know? It's natural. Just as the spring comes um, after the winter, it's natural. And, and so that is why that book uh, sold 500, um, uh, not 500, 5 million copies in the US. And even in Japan, it was translated. It sold millions. And so it had an impact on the way we looked at death. And I, I think that uh, um, there's been a, PBS, uh, Public uh, Broadcasting Corporation, uh, you know, um, uh, TV series on death based on Buddhism. Um, so I, I think that uh, that is one of the things that we can be, uh, uh, w that Buddhism is making a contribution um, that is positive for uh, North American societies. Okay, so... Um, um, Again, I talked about the, the, the welcome part of the... Uh, so uh, again, I, I wanted to stress, earlier I talked about the non-affiliated people 
the nuns or the NRBS, not religious but spiritual. There are many people who say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And, um, and I have a feeling that uh, these people are the, in, are the so, some, of the, some of these people are kind of taking interest in Buddhism because Buddhism is seen uh, more as a spiritual tradition, not as a religion. And that is one way of pitching Buddhism. Uh, we certainly don't, uh, you know, uh, feel like everyone has to become Buddhist. You know, Dalai Lama is, uh, is popular for many things, but when he speaks to a lot of people, at the end he says, you don't, don't, you don't have to become a Buddhist. <laughs> you know, don't be a Buddhist, in fact, he says. You know, so he's not an evangelist saying, if you don't become a Buddhist, you know, you'll go somewhere. I mean, that, it's not that kind of attitude. And so, um, and I, that is something that I want to talk about here. Um, but before that, I just want to say a few words about, um, you know, Buddhism in a 2,600-year-old history has not gone over the wall, the Western wall, I call it. Um, the, the wall that's separating the East and the West. Of course, in the 17th, 18th century, Buddhism started to be known by the scholars, but it never became a religion of the masses or the ordinary people. But from 150 years ago, in America especially, Buddhism has begun to um, take root as a religion of ordinary people. And uh, of course, the, the Asian immigrants brought Buddhism to America. But uh, after, especially since 1960, 65 on especially, that many people who didn't grow up Buddhist are converting to Buddhism or are taking strong interest in Buddhism. And with that, we can say that this is the first in the history of Buddhism, that a Buddhist, Buddhism became rooted amongst the ordinary people in the West. And, so, and then another interesting point is that it was not transported or imported by kings and the emperors as it did in Asia. If you know the history of a Buddhism in Asia, the Buddhism was really transported mostly by the ruling elite, not by ordinary people. They wanted Buddhism because of the, not only the religion, but also the arts and the architecture, the technology and the, uh, the med medicine, all these other reasons. But, and, and so it had other benefits. But now in, in North America and Europe and others, Buddhism be, is invited, uh, taken in for its original intent, which is awakening, understanding, compassion. So there are no other frills uh, in the, the pure Buddhism is what people are looking for. Of course, nowadays, you know, mindfulness meditation has become very popular and it has become used for, you know, relieving tension and for non-religious purposes. But still, I think it's still positive. It's leading to the uh, alleviation of suffering in some respect. But it is a, uh, there is a shortcoming that it is being used for a uh, uh, secular purpose. So, uh, but at the same time, my position is that as someone interested in Buddhism as a, as, at its face value, we don't need to, to, you know, reject it, that we can use, take it in and promote it, and then hopefully to lead others to the, the, the real intent of meditation, which is realization and awakening. Um, okay, so uh, I want to talk about passing the torch in, in terms of five ways. Why, what, who, whom, and how. Okay. So why? Why do we uh, want to pass the torch? And it's not because, um, you know, we have to save the, the poor souls who are not Buddhists. That's not our attitude. Uh, our attitude is, uh, Pali is ehipasiko, 
Ehi pasiko, means please come here and see. So earlier I talked about how if we're joyful, we're having fun and being happy, then we can say, oh, are you interested? You come here and check it out. Ehi pasiko, you know. So, um, by the way, pasiko is cognate of perceive because it's in the European language. So, ehi pasiko, come here, ehi, come here and see. And that is a kind of, a, you know, more of a wholesome attitude than saying, or, you know, if you don't see, uh, you know, you, you must take Buddhism. So, I think it's, okay, you know, I think that's the strength. Some people say, you know, we don't, therefore, we don't really are active enough, but I think that attitude uh, will draw people who can appreciate that. And then secondly, uh, benefiting others uh, as part of self-benefit and benefit for others. Japanese is called jiri dita. Uh, Sanskrit is called sva arta, para arta. Sva means self, para means others, arta means benefit. And that's the basic, uh, we want, we have found something that is worthy in us and we want to share with others because we care about others. That's another aspect. Interdependence means that we are connected, we care about others, you know, but we don't want to force it upon them. If they have their own religion, that's fine, you know. Many years ago, I was in a um, Buddhist Christian dialogue conference and in a small group discussion, and I was, uh, the topic was, can they be saved in the other tradition. So I asked my Christian uh, friend, uh, counterpart, can I be saved? And she said, mm, I'm sorry, no. I, was, I knew that in the head because if you don't accept Jesus, you cannot be saved. But he, she was almost a friend. But doctrinally, she said, you cannot be saved. Then, I, then, then uh, uh, the session ran out of time. But if I were asked the same question, if she were to ask me, can I be saved? I would say, why not? <laughs> you know, I hope you are, you can. And I, I, I believe that if you walk your path, the Christian path, you will be saved. And that is the difference. And I think that we should be proud of that. And I, I include Dr. Bloom in this effort. I, whenever I think about passing the torch, I think of Al, well, because, you know, he was a professor at the uh, uh, University of Hawaii, but he left it early to come to the Institute of Buddhist Studies to, to become the dean because he wanted to share his personal teachings, you know, that he felt so strongly about. You know, he was a fundamental Christian. When he was young, he was in the, uh, he was in the military, came to Japan as a member of the U.S. Army. He was given, he was given a, a talk on Christianity, and he's, he was talking about God, and the Japanese translator translated like Amida Buddha. And then Dr. Bloom, he turned around, well, he wasn't a doctor then, he was a young 19-year-old. He turned around and said, what? There is something like God? Because he was taught that there's only God. Nothing is like it. And he, 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 he heard about, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's like Amida, and it shocked him. And that's why when he went back to America, took interest in Buddhism, and eventually got his PhD at Harvard, and became a professor of religion, but also became a Shin Buddhist. He got ordained. And then to the end of his life, you know, and till this day, you can still, you can find it in the uh, announcement that Dexter passed out, that there is a link to his homepage or web, web page that you can check out. He has all kinds of important uh, lessons and he has lessons on Shin Buddhism um, that you can uh, partake. And so he was till the end exemplifying passing the torch to the very end. And Shinran too, and Buddha too. So um, again, you know, we cannot all be like the Buddha and Shinran or even Dr. Bloom, but we can do whatever we can in our capacity. So the, that's the why, the what. The what is the, what are we uh, passing on? Obviously, it's the Buddhism. It's the teachings and the practices. 
And again, um, uh, I already talked about how Bud Buddhism is seen in a positive light. But actually, Buddhism is not so exotic in America or North America. Um, that uh, recently, I wanted to show you a book that I, I love. Uh, it's called here, uh, Buddhist Modernism. Um, uh, Buddhist Modernism. It's by uh, David McMahon. Uh, I can send this out later uh, to other people, but uh, here, this book called Mo Buddhist Modernism is, is how Buddhism uh, developed in America. And what he says, one of the many things he says is that there are, Buddhism is not so exotic. There are exotic parts about Buddhism that uh, Americans could not easily accept you know, uh, like reincarnation and, um, you know, uh, nirvana becoming like extinction, which is not extinct. Extinction was a bad translation. Nirvana is uh, much more full, much more lively. And, 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 but, um, but here, what he says is that actually in American culture, there already existed values that are similar to Buddhism, which allowed for Buddhism to be uh, accept a little bit more easily. And that is found in the romanticists, romanticism, transcendentalists, and rationalists. And, and these are the fundamental you know, thoughts of, uh, of America, or Western, Western civilization almost, the modern Western civilization. But I wanted to speak of it in terms of uh, my own experience, which makes it a little bit easier. When I was in high school, <clears throat> somehow, I, I wasn't an avid reader, but I was drawn to Henry Thoreau, the transcendentalist, uh, transcendent Henry Thoreau. And he has a famous essay called The Walden Pond. And in it, you know, he leaves this, uh, the city, goes out into the woods, lives in this uh, cabin with hardly any furniture. And he enjoys the solitude of uh, being in nature. And somehow it just drew me and, and you know, my, no one ever told me to read that book. And I think it's partly because by then I was already somewhat of a Buddhist. Uh, and then, and uh, so that, uh, but then later I learned that transcendentalists uh, in the around 1840s, uh, um, they took interest in Hinduism and Buddhism. In fact, when Hen Henry Thoreau died, his friends commented that his face looked so peaceful, like the Buddha. And so, and then, so transcendentalists uh, emphasize and, and romantic uh, uh, people who advocated uh, romanticism, uh, romantics, yeah. And there are different varieties, of course, but in general, the, they talked of, actually about inter interdependence. Uh, ideas of interdependence, like organic whole of, whole, wholeness of nature and our insep inseparability. We're not inseparable from it. And feeling of awe and reverence for nature. And nature seen as not par just part of God's creation, but part of God. Not just part of God's creation, but God itself and connection to nature through cultivation of solitude, especially in Thoreau. So you have already precedents. And there's a notion also of, um, among the ro romantics, of what is called subjective turn or inward turn. Uh, there's a tradition uh, of, of turning inward. Uh, truth is within, not outside the power of the individual mind to observe one's emotions and inclinations. These are part of the romantic tradition. And that is why I think meditation is very important, attract, attractive to Americans, that there is a, a fundamental uh, subliminal kind of a, a, a tradition that's already there. And, but Christianity and Islam, though he had a kind of a, that kind of meditative tradition, it's no longer very strong. And that's why Buddhism has, um, has, has 
uh, uh, provided that for uh, many Americans in an easy way, in a way that anyone can practice. Um, so, um, so these notions of interdependence, nature, wholeness, subjective turn, and uh, even this one last point, rationalism, which is more opposed to romant romanticism, uh, it, seem, it seems it's different, but uh, this, this book talks about how that um, the power of the individual mind to observe emotions, inclination, or to see yourself objectively, you know, that it, it, is a part of the way we, how we look at Buddhism. Okay, this may have been a little uh, complicated, but uh, I, so uh, we're running out of time here, so I, I want to go rather quickly. Again, I mentioned that uh, Buddhism is a religion of awakening, not of belief. Not believing in something that you cannot see. So that's why, you know, we talked earlier about God. God is not a major issue in Buddhism, you know. It's how we experience life and um, how to deal uh, uh, with, with what, we, what we are confronted with. Um, the other point that we can emphasize, again, is that Buddhism has made a difference in the history of Asia. Um, I want to mention two things very quickly, and some of you already know this, but uh, let me talk first about, uh, um, well, okay. Uh, when uh, Japan lost the war, 1951, the San Francisco Peace uh, Conference, uh, where they drew up the peace treaty, there were many people uh, uh, on the winning side, including Russia, wanted to divide up in, uh, Japan or to, to uh, uh, demand a lot of reparation, getting pay, having Japan pay a lot of money, pay for the damages. But if, they, if that had gone through, Japan would not be what it is today. I tell that to the Japanese young people. The benefits, the, the wealthy country that you now live in, it's because of what this Sri Lankan representative said at that meeting. His name is J.R. Jayawardane, who eventually became president, okay? And when this discussion uh, heated up and they wanted, demanded reparation money from Japan, um, he quoted from a Buddhist scripture, from the Dhammapada. He said, a hatred is not overcome by hatred. Hatred is overcome only by love. And that supposedly changed, uh, re it's reported that it changed the flow of the discussion. And eventually those demands were taken down. So here we have a Buddhist quotation, a Buddhist, a very uh, sincere Buddhist at, at that, quoting a Buddhist scripture and changed the turn and changed the course of history. Another point, 1956, you know, there are 200 outcasts in India today. They call them Dalits or Harijans or untouchables, right? Well, uh, they're all part of the caste system or the whole system. They're out of the caste, but they're still part of that. 1956, the leader, his name is Bimaro Ramji Ambedkar. Some of you know him. Ambedkar was uh, Dr. Ambedkar, who was from the untouchable class. He was educated in, in London at, at Columbia University in New York, got his PhD, and helped to write the Constitution. But he was still a Dalit. He was still an untouchable. So he got fed up with Hinduism, the way he, they were being treated. So he converted in 1956 to, to, to Buddhism because he saw Buddhism as a religion of equality and non-discrimination. And so today uh, there are, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of uh, Buddhists, probably close to 1% now, there still is not a whole lot, but mostly all untouchables because of Ambedkar, because they feel that, uh, you know, it is a religion of non-discrimination. And, and, and and I always talk about how there are three truths in all, all true religions, which is love and compassion, second, equality, 
or treating people equally, and thirdly, uh, teaching of oneness, interdependence, we are connected. And so in this time, needless to say, China and US are at odds with each other. I'm really hoping that nothing serious come out of this. Uh, if there is a incident in the South China Sea, it can lead to something more horrible. And because of the election in the US, our president is you know, stoking this kind of fear and, um, and hatred. But uh, we need to, to go back to the, the true religions, uh, uh, espouse you know, non-discrimination and, and love and compassion. Okay. One other thing I wanted to uh, point out is that I said, what do we pass on? We pass on Dharma. But sometimes uh, the present Buddhist churches, especially Buddhist churches of America and uh, Hawaii, you have temples that are going out of business, so to speak. There are no longer people who can you know, support it. The case of Spokane, Washington is, a, is an interesting one, that all the traditional Buddhists were no, lo were no longer around, or there were very few left. They could not keep the temple. So they thought of closing it up, you know, just abandon it, sell it. But they made a wise choice. They said, okay, we're gonna leave this facility to anyone who is interested. So they opened it up and lo and behold, many other people, people who were not traditional Buddhists, uh, who were not, well, specifically not Japanese American Buddhists. And now it's predominantly um, made up of uh, non-Japanese Americans. And, and, and it's, it's doing quite well. And so it's an example of, you know, don't shut your, uh, your temples and close it down. You know, open it up, pass it on down to other people who want it. And, you know, that's a treasure that we have uh, for others who are interested. Okay, number, uh, now we talk about uh, why and what and who. So who passes the torch? Of course, the ministers play a great role, the priests, because they're the professionals. But one point I want to make is that they're not enough. They're not enough of them to really uh, spend the time to promote the religion. So I think we should empower the lay people. Uh, many of you who are uh, well-educated, who know a lot, and they should be encouraged to write in the local newspapers and, and be the speakers. Uh, we, in, North, uh, in BCA, uh, there are the minister's assistants who are doing a lot of this. And I, I, I think we need to promote, have more people like that. We need to have more women become ministers. We need to have uh, people who of, uh, of various racial and ethnic traditions, uh, uh, backgrounds. Uh, obviously, you know, in China, um, when Buddhism first went to China, it was accepted by the non-Chinese people, non-Han people. It stayed that way for a couple hundred years. But eventually, it opened up to the general population, and only then it became a religion of the Chinese people. Um, uh, if it had stayed within the ethnic, ethnic uh, empires up north, it would have died out. But it was only in the in the, you know, around uh, year 500 and into Tang period that it became a religion of the overall Han people. So the same thing should, ha has to be done. Okay. And then uh, that's the who uh, and Okay, to whom, uh, let's see. And, okay, well, uh, so I just talked about who passes on, and I, you know, I emphasize the importance of uh, lay people and having, uh, I feel like the importance of women becoming ministers because they can actually talk about Buddhism uh, with a different uh, perspective. Uh, I find uh, uh, female teachers to be more down to earth, they talk about the, uh, more of the living issues of our lives, uh, not about the traditions and how important that is. That's important, but uh, we want people-centered, uh, not, not the tradition-centered only. We have to have a balance. But, uh, and I, I'll finish very quickly. The fourth one is to whom? 
and I already talked about this, to whom do we pass the torch? We pass it down to our kids and our grandchildren, but also to people in general, in the general society. And that, this is obvious. Uh, so, but sometimes um, when we say pass the torch to the next generation, we're only thinking about our own uh, kins and our relatives, but that, that is not the, the Buddhist spirit. Lastly, how do we pass the torch? And um, um, I think um, uh, to, when we do it to, for our grandchildren and, and, uh, and children, uh, and, um, what is important is our two things, conviction and knowledge, and especially conviction. And that manifests in the way we act. And I already talked about this, so I won't go on too much, but modeling children, especially grandchildren, in Japan, often people who are very interested in religion at their older age, you know what they talk about? The influence is not their, not their parents so much. It's the grandchildren, grandparents, especially the grandmother. And so if you're a grandparent, I think that you have a greater role to impact. And again, I'm going to say it's, it's, it's not easy when you share with members of, your, of, of a family. But it's by you yourself being a sincere Buddhist in what we do. You know, uh, I talked already about um, uh, at meals, you put our hands together. We taught our kids to say, you know, Namo Amida Butsu, uh, Itadakimasu, and then saying, thank you, mommy, for preparing the food. But, you know, we can take a moment longer than that and looking at the food and seeing for example, if you saw a, a bacon, you try to think about the original form, which will be a live pig, okay? So that reminds you that as you're eating your bacon, that, li that originally was a living being that you had to take in order for you to have that, the, the, the bacon that you love. Well, ultimately, you know, out for ourselves, that too is important for us to, to, to re remember. Um, so, uh, how to talk about the teachings to your kids, actually talk about them and not so much in terms of teachings, but talk about, you know, you know how I, you know, you can talk about, you know, I'm having some issues with getting old, you know, it's getting harder and harder. Um, I'm getting a little foggy and things like that, but you can say something to the fact that, but you know, my religion, Buddhism teaches that's the way things happen. That's natural. So I accept it. And I look back to all the things that made my life possible. The fact that I'm able to be a grandmother now, grandfather now, means that you live more than 60 years old. And that means that there are all these factors that made it possible, so I'm grateful. And just by sharing that thought to your grandchild, I bet that child will remember that for the rest of his or her life. So uh, a personal sharing, and that's the torch. You know, make yourself the lamp, make yourself the light. And so the question is, are you a light in the Dharma? And so just, just live it. And then finally, uh, <clears throat> the other things about the technicalities of how to uh, share the teachings with others. Um, uh, it, you know, SNS, um, all this, you know, advertise and, and I, frankly speaking, are especially the, uh, the traditional Buddhists, including the Jodo Shinshu Buddhists and Buddhists in America and in Canada. Um, uh, we have, we do not, you know, uh, uh, advertise. We do not reach out as much as we should, I think, that when we have, uh, you know, talks like this, um, I think there should be a greater effort to, you know, share. And I know Dexter did a lot, a great job, but um, in most cases that it's kept within and it's like a secret, you know, and that no wonder people back then thought Buddhism was a religion where you uh, meditated, staring at each other's navel. And so it's not, Buddhism isn't like that. And that's why we have to um, uh, uh, think more, effectively of how to reach out. And um, so I talked about the, the why, what, who, whom, 
and how. I, I, so it's already clear, uh, written more in detail in the, in, in the outline. So, um, but in finally, once again, going back to the, uh, you know, um, the becoming a torch on, be, be a light onto yourself or make myself the lamp and, and then uh, make the Dharma the lamp also. We, we rely on the Dharma to make ourselves the lamp. And then we take that torch, that lamp, that light and pass it on uh, not in a forceful way or demanding way, with uh, always remembering the three things of being confident in, in the religion and being joyful, and then trying to be relevant to the needs of people. So we need to be person-centered, not only Dharma, uh, tradition-centered. So thank you. That concludes my uh, second part. Okay, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes, not as much as we wanted, but uh, well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ken. Um, yeah, now we go into our kind of final question and answers. And if you, you know, want to um, ask him a question, you know, please uh, send me a chat and I will then um, help you unmute. Um, you know, and you'll, you know, have your turn that way. Uh, just to let you know that, uh, you know, Dr. Tanaka will uh, be staying for a Paohana session after, you know, our formal closing at 4.15. Um, Dexter, you, know, you, have to, you have to explain what Paohana, it's a Hawaiian, I didn't even know. Paohana is, uh, af after work is done, you know, you, you get together. And so, you know, it's basically a, another 30 minutes of, you know, kind of informal conversations, uh, you know, with those of you that would like to, you know, stay on and kind of chat with uh, uh, Professor Tanaka. Um, but, you know, we will, you know, kind of have our, our regular closing, you know, at the appointed hour of 415. So, um, um, I'm looking at the chats. You know, we did have some other questions earlier that I put into the uh, chat line for uh, Dr. Tanaka. Um, and I think uh, we had something from uh, Kimi Onikura. Um, you know, according to your book in Japanese, you mentioned that a number of Buddhists in the US are growing also globally, but seems like uh, most likely Zen meditation type of Buddhism. What do you think about Shinshu futures in the United States? Mm. Uh, how are we going to approach the next generation? Uh, anything we can learn from your teaching experience to young college students in Japan? So we'll start off with that as, uh, no. as I wait for others to uh, respond. Well, uh, <clears throat> the it's true that the Buddhism that is growing, uh, traditions, uh, denominations that are growing, have a strong uh, meditative tradition. So there are Zen, uh, Theravada, or Southeast Asian form, and a third is Tibetan. They all have a well thought out, easy to access uh, meditation. Uh, and uh, so in, for Joro Shinshu, I think that because uh, of the lack of a specific practice like that, um, uh, uh, it may not, it, it, pro it doesn't, um, uh, is not a, as attractive. And, and of course, we know that it's often um, uh, considered like Christianity, I often talk about how I was called a Christian Buddhist one time when I introduced myself at a Buddhist conference. And, and um, so that, that, that is true. So, but um, I think that um, uh, without you know, emphasizing any practice, Jodo Shinshu has elements that are very attractive. First of all, it's a family religion. 
it's for the householder uh, because Shinran, as we said earlier, was the only householder or married clergy. And, and so uh, we are um, uh, open to, you know, children participating. And I think that part of it, it's a family religion. And that's something we can uh, emphasize. And, um, and there are people who are uh, interested in a, a Buddhist tradition that is, um, uh, that where the entire family can participate. Uh, and, you know, having services on Sundays. And so I think even if we didn't do anything new, anything different, but just, you know, welcoming people and being open to others uh, and just opening the door, I think there will be plenty of people who uh, will take interest in, in uh, Buddhism, I mean, uh, Shinshu. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, of, there are many non Japanese or non-Japanese Americans who have become ministers. Obviously, we saw Reverend Kaufman there. And amongst the uh, minister's assistants in the BCA, I understand we have about 200 of them. You know, I, I think more than half, at least half, are non-Japanese Americans. So you already see that, you know, you don't have to have meditation uh, to be attractive. It's just that we haven't really pitched ourselves as much. And... Um, now, uh, I think that uh, the teaching that you are accepted just as you are, uh, that, that teaching, without any judgment, that teaching has been very mm, uh, uh, appealing to a lot of people. And, you know, there's some uh, people here who, are, who have converted to Shinshu, and they attest to that. There's no judgment. Uh, it's, it's unconditional embrace. And, and, but, and, but that is uh, something, it's a high, high level of uh, awakening because one has to actually, uh, well, it's not for everyone. I'm, saying, I, I'm not saying that we all have to do this, but Shinran Shonin spent 20 years as a monk, you know, what we called in a self-styled, self-powered manner, and he couldn't find the answer. And at the 20, at the, at, 29, he found the answer in the teaching of other power. But that was made possible because he had made that effort. So, so my take on Shinshu, now if you don't have to change anything, my take on Shinshu is that we should talk more about what we can do. Not simply, not simply you know, accept the compassion of Amida or just simply reciting the Nembuts. So, but this is not to say it's self-powered. It's like Shinran, 20 years of Shinran, you know, he's kind of, you know, tilling the soil for the, the seed to, to uh, you know, take roots. And so I think that element of questioning and doubting and, and um, searching is important part of Buddhism. Buddhism is a religion of awakening. You know, it takes some effort to awaken. Shinshu is not a, a you know, couch potato Buddhism. You know, no, do nothing. You know, we, we're sometimes, or uh, Shin Buddhists are sometimes called do nothing uh, Buddhists. But that's not true. I mean, in fact, listening, to, so we do emphasize listening. So I think we have to uh, listen. So, which means that we ministers have to tell good sermons. <laughs> we have to get, give good sermons, you know. So we often say, you know, listen to the teaching, listen to the teaching. But I hear some lay people say, yeah, we try to, but it puts us to sleep. Not all the time, of course, but, you know, so we have, we have to make effort on our part. So that's the, so we can do, um, you know, contempl of contemplation that I talked about. So that is why I, when I go speak, even in Japan, in fact, in a conservative part of Japan, to a bunch of ministers, you know what I did? I had them do meditation. Uh, Nembutsu meditation, you know, and uh, I knew that I would, I would get criticism and I did get some criticism, some pushback, but I, you know, I said, uh, look at Shinran, you know, and what they say often is, well, we know what his conclusion is, other power, we don't have to do anything. I said, yeah, well, that's a conclusion, but what ha what's the 20 years of Mount Hiei? How do you, what are you doing? 
And so, and then, you know, the Gomonshu recently came up with a new set of uh, teachings that very simply, our pledge or my pledge. I don't know if some of you know that. And that one, and they criticize, some of them criticize that. The Gomonshu, the, his eminence, the leader of our tradition, you know, they didn't like it. And I said, why? He says, well, he says, we have to be like the Buddha, you know. And I said, well, we, the Monshu is teaching us what is the ideal. If you don't know what an ideal is, you don't know what, what good is, then how do you know when you realize that you cannot fulfill it completely, which was his conclusion, right? We are foolish, ordinary beings. We could not fulfill all those um, demands. But he was able to real, come to that realization because he made the effort. So I think we have to make a difference, distinction between self-effort and self-power. Self-power is what we don't want, is the idea that my action will lead to enlightenment. I'm taking credit, I'm being boastful. Well, that's the opposite of enlightenment. You're not humble, you're not, you know. But self-effort is any activity that we do to self, for self-reflection and to ultimately come to realize how far we are from the ideals of Buddhism. And, and that is an important part of awakening, the realization that we are imperfect. Okay, so I'll stop at that. Okay, the next question comes from Dave Atchison. Uh, hello, Dr. Tanaka. Thank you yeah. very much for your lectures. And uh, I think this question actually follows along fairly well from the previous discussion there. It's a question about engaged Buddhism. Okay. And I think it's prompted largely by a couple of things, but one of them being the recent passage of John Lewis, um, who was basically the, in a way, kind of the receiver of the torch, although he and Martin Luther King Jr. were kind of carrying the torch simultaneously. But he was the youngest speaker at the March in Washington. And by the time he was 19, he was already super engaged. And, and teenagers younger than him were some of those that really um, accelerated in the civil rights movement, the progress towards change. And sometimes it was, they were running out ahead of kind of the elders of the movement who played a bit of catch up. Anyway, as we look at um, the Black Lives Matter movement and the demonstrations in the streets and the young people getting engaged, um, I've been following some editorializing and some postings on the BCA website, as well as the message of our own bishop here in Hawaii and um, through the Young Buddhist editorial. Um, I just would ask you to maybe comment a little bit. I know, I realize you've probably been in Japan this whole time during the coronavirus and the, mm -hmm. um, the recent Black Lives Matter um, demonstrations on the street. Yeah. But if you could just comment on kind of a Buddhist perspective, if young people come to you and say, what are your thoughts on me getting involved in, in this particular effort or sort of that kind of activism? Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll leave it at that. I, I'm, one of the chants that you hear is no justice, no peace. And I've asked this of more than one minister, but part of my question um, you could respond to would be about the nature of peace and how much that requires in, from a Buddhist perspective that true peace yeah. also be underlaid by justice. So yeah. anyway, big well, question I know. Okay, uh, okay I'll, I'll take a shot. Uh, <laughs> I said earlier that three of the principles of true religion are love and compassion, equality, or treating people equally, or that no treating people so that we realize that we each person has equal worth. And then lastly is interconnectedness or oneness, that we are all interconnected. So those three, so at the top we have love and compassion, compassion and love, uh, real caring, and then equality. So um, Black Lives Matter and what has been what has been going on in, in the U.S. Uh, is an example of uh, of you know uh, certain groups of pe group, groups of people a uh, group of people not having been treated equally, and so 
uh, as a Buddhist, um, I think that um, the uh, efforts to, to rectify the wrong uh, should be a no-brainer, you know? Uh, I really think that if, um, if you saw that uh, George Floyd being killed uh, at the hands of the police and not be moved by it, then there is something wrong with you. I will say that. I will, if you cannot be moved and say, this is wrong, you know, you don't treat people, another human being that way. And so I myself, um, in fact, uh, I was going to, if, uh, if it was no uh, pandemic now, I wanted to go to the American consulate in Tokyo, the embassy, and, uh, you know, uh, demonstrate there. I would have done that. Um, but I figure, you know, uh, I have to care for my health and my wife's health and all that. So, uh, so I think um, that um, if you're Buddhist, and again, the action that we take in the world will have to be left up to the individual, uh, that we cannot dictate to all Buddhists that since we believe in equality, that you should take certain action. So, uh, other people's act, but, but, but what, what is important is how about you? You know, how do you feel? What are you going to do about it? And that can take a different form. So uh, this is one of the issues with religious organization. And I'm, I'm, I know that you're not asking about organization. We have had many issues, social issues in the past, in the Buddhist Church of America, that people uh, 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 felt... Uh, agreed basically in cer on cer you know, cer certain issues, but they could not agree on what actions to take. So anyway, I think that uh, um, the best thing is for us to, to think in terms of first person, uh, you know, self, make yourself the lamp. And so um, if a young person who comes to, to me and says, well, what should I do as a Buddhist? Then, you know, think about it. You know, your, your understanding of Buddhism what do you think about it? And if you feel outrage, if you feel that, you know, we, we need to work for justice, by all means. And there are plenty of uh, reasons, uh, doctrinally and teaching-wise, to support your action. Um, but just don't be disappointed that other Buddhists will not, you know, follow in the same course. Um, you know, um, so, uh, uh, but I, I would think that tr traditionally in Asia, the emphasis has been on, on mental tranquility and, and peace of mind. But um, I feel like uh, if the aim of Buddhism is to reduce suffering, uh, it's not just mental suffering, but it's also the social conditions that lead to suffering. So, um, you know, we have to do what we can to reduce the causes of suffering. And but traditional Buddhism has not gone that far, even, even though now, in, even in Asia, there are many actions like that, um, what we call engaged Buddhism. I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. That helps a lot. Okay. okay our next question comes from Angela. Angela. Good. Oh, hi, Tanaka-sensei. Let me say, tell, Angela is from Brazil. So I'm glad. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> actually, she's a, a minister of the Honganji uh, tr Shin tradition. So, Reverend uh, Andrade or Angela? Oh, thank you. Thank Good to you. See you. Good to see you too. Thank you for your talk. Good to hear you. And uh, in your broad perspective on how to pass the torch, I was thinking about you know, works on translation that I'm involved with with um, and I think so in, to, in terms of passing the torch and uh, I wonder what you, you could talk about I mean the importance of translation uh -huh. and to Portuguese language and it's what I've been doing and mm -hmm. but for many languages okay. as a way of course of, of passing sure. the torch also sure. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for uh, pointing that out. Um, passing the torch involves the uh, many ways, uh, you know, uh, translating mm -hmm. into different languages. 
and uh, uh, Angela has been involved in ch uh, translating uh, mostly Shin materials, Joro Shinshi material into, um, into uh, Portuguese. In fact, uh, she just, she's completed a translation of my uh, Ocean book, book Ocean, Introduction to Joro Shinshi Buddhism. She just completed it, so hopefully you'll be uh, published soon. So, um, of course, you know, Xuan uh, Zhang, who is a famous uh, monk in the seventh century China. You know about him, he's traveled for 17 years, uh, went back to, to India from China to retrieve all these uh, scriptures and spend the rest of his life translating. And because of that, we had so many uh, activities and uh, teachers who came out of it. And uh, um, uh, BDK, uh, that is, that published my book, this present book, uh, is doing, uh, amongst many projects, is trans translating, uh, you know, the Taisho Tripitaka, the canon, the Buddhist canon, the huge canon. Uh, there are a hundred volumes, you know, each volume has a thousand pages, and we're translating the first 139 into English, and I'm I actually, I'm involved in that project. And so, you know, that is an uh, uh, important part of uh, passing the torch, because, uh, yeah, I talked about relevance. If people cannot read it, then the teaching cannot be transport, uh, transported, and so um, passed on. So, um, uh, you know, Angela has done such a great job in uh, helping with the translation of uh, Shin material. Yes, that's good. I'm glad you pointed it out. So, so different ways of, you know, I would say even um, uh, cleaning the garden at the temple uh, voluntarily, that is uh, helping to uh, transport, helping at the bazaar, you know. But the point is that uh, while you clean a garden and you help at the bazaar, you also attend the services and the study classes or learn or do one of the anything to learn. And so that uh, you, 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 be, you understand the teaching for yourself, for your conviction and knowledge. Okay. Okay. We have a question from Alan Kubota, who's from Hawaii Betsuin. Okay. Uh, this is Alan. Te technology has made this such an instant society. Passing the torch of Buddhism does not necessarily provide an instant result slash gratification. How may we address this generation's need for speed? Well, um, you know, anything that has good and a bad, you know, um, but definitely the technology has a lot, many positives. So you can reach many people like we're doing today in different parts of the world. And, um, but I think it has to, as you say, um, it has to be followed up by, you know, more quality uh, interaction uh, that, you know, uh, if someone learns about Buddhism or your temple, they come, then you have to make a, you know, uh, a concerted effort to reach out to that person make it more meaningful and make it personable for that person. So um, um, now uh, I think you're making comment about people in general, how they want gratification. But um, um, I think that um, it is true that people want gratification and there'll be people who are impatient. And I know there are many people who come to temples and they just visit once or two or three times and they're gone. And that's, you know, you can't help, you can't help. But we have to make sure that if they did come, that you do the best to give quality time and to make them welcome. You know, they can tell if you're just, you know, going through the motion. So uh, I think that if you are interested in passing the torch to new people, then as I just said, utilize the, you know, the internet, the, the digital world, uh, because, um, you know, they can do things that we couldn't do before. But also we have to follow that up by a more quality kind of interaction and sincerity and a sense of conviction. And remember that to, so that they can under, see that you're having fun and, and j joyful and that it's worthy. So 
I don't know if I answered your question, but if you can follow, if you want to follow up. Okay. Um, we had a question from Kazumi Kuruma, I believe probably from Japan. Uh, okay. I now learn many younger American people became Buddhist and are interested in Buddhism through mindfulness meditation. Zen and essential are common to all denominations, Buddhism teachings. How do they feel about Jodo Shinshu, which tends to be considered similar to Christianity that they escaped from? Hmm. Yeah, so um, I kind of uh, alluded or talked about this earlier. Um, so uh, the interest in Jodo Shinshu is not as strong as in those others. That is clear in terms of numbers. But there are enough people who are interested. And uh, uh, so uh, actually, I, I kind of answered much of this. So I, I don't want to repeat myself. But um, um, so the la last part of the question was, how, uh, Dexter, can you read it again? The, the last yeah, I, part? Um, I guess, how, you know, how do they feel Jodo, about Jodo Shinshu? which tends to be considered similar to Christianity that they escaped yeah. from. Yeah, well, uh, uh, actually, many people don't know much about Jodo Shinshu. You know, they, they have kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a casual understanding that it is, as you say, uh, like Christianity, or it's people, it's a religion for the populace, or uh, uh, it's more devotional, and that um, so uh, it, it, it actually that's why we have a huge, huge uh, task to really convey Buddhism uh, in the broader world. And those who understand do understand, but it is far and few between. So um, uh, I think that is what uh, many of us are trying to do. To present Buddhism, uh, Jodo Shinshu, in a in, in uh, accurately and in an inviting and appealing way, um, but uh, I think if we present it traditionally, it will not be appealing. It has to take a, a different approach um, uh, in terms of teaching, and uh, so. Uh, but again, institutionally. I think uh, the uh, teaching of the family, for the family, um, householder, that is appealing. So, but uh, uh, I think that uh, for young people who want to do things, uh, they may feel somewhat um, inadequate uh, or that the teaching is not inadequate because it doesn't have uh, clear cut practice and meditation. But um, that's where, and I earlier talked about how, how we can innovate uh, to, uh, in presenting the teaching. Okay, so since I talked about it quite a bit earlier, so that, that I'll keep it at that. Thanks for the question. Okay, okay. I, I, I have no, no further you know, questions. Uh, so the microphone mm -hmm. is open for anybody that would like to uh, have the uh, shot at it. Okay. There's June, June Masayama. Yes. yes. Um, I just have a couple of comments here. Um, I think with the uh, shelter in place that we've been, you know, for the past four months, uh, most of the ministers in California, I think, are doing their services online or YouTube or whatever. So I think there's, I'm assuming that people, not just members, but just people out there are looking for something um, maybe religious or whatever, something to make them feel good. And so I think there's, there's a, I'm thinking there's a really good possibility that there may be a lot of people who are not Buddhists uh, or are not going to Buddhist churches um, may be interested after all this is over, whenever that's going to be. And I think like you were talking, it's really important that if they decide that they want to come and visit 
our temple uh, because they liked the sermons that they heard, then, then I think we really need, as members, we really need to work really hard to make them, uh, to, to um, invite them and be friendly and be excited and, you know, uh, be welcoming. Um, so that's just my one statement. And the other is, you know, I grew up um, going to church in the 50s and 60s because my family was Buddhists, and so it was not anything that I had to really think about. Um, and I think back then, too, there was a reason to go there because my friends were there, and it was fun. And life is really different now. I have grandkids, and I don't know how to get them to church. So yeah. how do I do that? Well, part of uh, getting the uh, young people to church, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, 40% of the young people and probably you know, even more, uh, they may be affiliated, but they just don't have the time. time that's, or, that's what it is. Uh, and, 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 and the lifestyle has changed so much. You know, so uh, that's why we have to change the way we think about how uh, w people relate to the, the church or the temple. Yeah. Uh, I've been saying uh, what's called one-dimensional affiliation, in other words, or participation. Rather than having one person become a member and be expected to do a lot of things, you will not get the young people to do that anymore, mm -hmm. I think. But right. if you can have one activity that they're interested in, and so then they will participate in that activity, and in that way they're affiliated with a temple. Uh, right. And then, yeah. Yeah, because I think, you know, it's the way it was in the past was we went to church for, like I said, social reasons or whatever. It's really changed over the past 20 years or whatever, where people want to come to our church. They want to learn about the religion, which is yeah. really different from the way it was 40 years ago. Yes. Yeah, so that that is, uh, we're talking also about a uh, 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 phenomenon of ethnic group relying on a religion for their social and cultural needs. Mm -hmm. But that, those needs have almost disappeared. Right. And, and, and so we have to make the transition to really becoming uh, a religious organization. So right. in that regard, I think that at the temple, you know, you have different committees. I mm -hmm. bet you that your bazaar committee has more money and more people involved than the religious education committee. Mm -hmm. right? And so what I'm saying is that uh, we, we, should, we should really want uh, new people to come and participate. You have to really develop that uh, religious education right. part or maybe a membership committee and work in tandem um, and, and that be, have people ready to, you know, uh, meet people, uh, not in an aggressive way, but in a welcoming way. But, um, uh, but I don't see that the effort is made uh, equally it's, on. It's, it's changing. I think temples are really changing, uh, especially in the Bay Area, because we do have, like, in the mornings, Sunday mornings when we used to have services, you know, we would have coffee and refreshments uh, half an hour before, hour before service started. So it was good. Yeah. Good. Well, you know, anything, not, you know, things of that nature. Right. So, uh, I, so I think that the next uh, 10 years is very critical. And, uh, and so I, I will say some temples will uh, survive and even flourish, and, uh, but uh, others may not. And when they, before they close down, make sure to pass, pass on the, the temple to other people who are interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't cling on to it. Yeah, that's attachment. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Good to see you. Yeah, as, as I think as good Buddhists, you know, we can try to uh, adapt and, lo and look at this COVID-19, you know, kind of uh, situation as an opportunity. And uh, for instance, with our summer session, our Buddhist study center uh, uh, summer session with Duncan Williams a few weeks ago, uh, we, we had as many as uh, uh, 3,200 viewers. Um, so it was... Uh, you know, a, a grand exposure, you know, wow. to things that we are doing 
And of course, we need to use this time to, you know, kind of improve ourselves. And, you know, when perhaps people, you know, come to our temples or, you know, if they, you know, kind of explore our websites, uh, Steve Atchison does a great job with our Hawaii Betsuin website um, to not only uh, share the history and the teachings, but, you know, kind of also the face of our temple and the activities that happen. So, um, you know, those are all kind of things to, to leverage at this point. So we don't have any more questions from folks. Um, and so um, I think it's, you know, yeah. it's, our time is, is up. So uh, Dr. Tanaka, would you like to here? Are you here? If you're here, can you? Hello, hi. Oh, okay, you are. Okay, good. I'm glad that uh, uh, some young people are here. And uh, uh, thanks again for uh, editing the book. And uh, please uh, do what you can. And do you have any last quick comment about since uh, we're talking about you guys and, and you have to sh probably speak for yourself. Anything, can you sh share some more uh, thoughts? Um, well, there's definitely been a cultural shift in the perception, or I think as we move on to this new generation, we have to also, while introducing new members and um, gaining new membership, we also need to, um, fix or um, teach people the true meaning of Buddhism. I often um, have, when I talk to friends or people who don't know much about Buddhism, there's often, they often have a certain mindset or perspective of what they think Buddhism is. So there's a lot of stereotypes yeah. and like misinformation about it. Yeah. Um, like, oh, you're vegan. Oh, um, you have to shave your head. <laughs> shave your so head. Those, <laughs> those stereotypes we also need to as we move forward we should try to educate more people to um the true meaning of buddhism and not just like what's shown on media and stuff like yes that. or that's just my take <laughs> yeah, no well, that that's your take and that's very important so uh you know again that's your torch and and please pass on that torch in the ways you have just talked. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I think uh, um, so. If anyone wants to remain afterwards, and uh, I may take out my wine and uh, <laughs> and uh, and nibble on that or uh, sip on that as we uh, talk for another half an hour. Okay. So uh, Dexter, I turn it over to you. Okay, so thank you everyone very much for attending the uh, the 21st uh, Bloom Futaba Memorial Lectures. Um, hope you enjoyed it and, uh, you know, uh, please be patient. Thank you for your understanding about our, our technical, you know, struggles as we learn how to do all this. But um, uh, and thank you to Dr. Tanaka for uh, coming to us all the way from Tokyo. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, just good. put our hands together for those of you who wish to, and we can just close this part of the meeting with Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namanda, Namanda, Namanda. Namo Amida Butsu. Namanda, Namanda, Namanda. So thank you all. Uh, you know, the Pauhana time, like thank Dr. Tanaka thank says, uh, one of our traditions at our summer session is that once it's over, you know, we do get around um, and, and have wine and beer and, and be very informal and just chat. So those of you who wish to stay on and uh, just talk about, uh, you know, what's, what's happening in Japan or elsewhere are, are uh, welcome to. So for, uh, we'll do that for about half an hour. Okay. Aloha. <laughs>